expand our imagination. Hello and welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Nancy Cordes. Yesterday, Indiana Senator Evan Bayh made waves when he announced that he would not run for a third term, putting Senate Democrats in an even more difficult position heading into the 2010 midterm elections than they were in already. Our political consultant Mark Aminder joins me for a roadmap of what lies ahead for the Democrats' suddenly fragile majority. And Mark, uh, Senator Bai says he's leaving because he just can't stand the partisan bickering in Washington anymore. It's a very popular excuse to give this day, these days, but is that really why he's leaving or is there something more? I think there's an element of that to it, but uh, I think the reason why he thinks there's a lot of partisan bickering may not be the reason why some others think. I mean, Evan Bayh has had a very complex relationship with liberals in his party and quite frankly has grown to hate them over the past several years. And I use that word advisedly. I mean, hate them because he thinks that they have increased the cost uh, of of negotiating with Republicans. In other words, making it more difficult for the Senate leadership and the House leadership to even make overtures and gestures uh, uh, on their own accord to increase the level of bipartisanship. So essentially he's blaming liberals in his own party, the liberal activists in particular, the net roots, for making bipartisanship unpopular. Um, he really does believe that that's one of the reasons why the Senate is in such stasis. Well, it seems like there's no lo love lost on either side. No, one spokesman were... uh, said, called him an empty suit yesterday in, in a conversation and that, that was I had one of with the him. The more milder things right. that people are saying. They were about really, uh, they really were caught off guard here. In fact, uh, Democratic officials were working on campaign strategy with his campaign staff yeah. right up until this weekend. Nobody saw this coming. He told Leader Reid at the last minute, uh, "Why?" go out on, on this kind of a note? Well, there are two theories. One is he kind of wanted to, quite frankly, uh, send a message to the White House and other Democrats that, you know what, you've done no favors for me and I'm not going to do any favors for you. Hmm. However, by cutting it so close to the line, and there's a very complex signature gathering process in Indiana, what he has essentially allowed the state party to do is choose its own candidate. Um, there is a, 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 a candidate named Tamara DiPolito who is trying to gather candidate signatures. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a little, um, shall we say, interesting, and I don't think she's going to gather the, the signatures necessary. So Democrats right now are polling and trying to figure out whether, let's say, a Baron Hill, a Brad Ellsworth, two very popular Democratic members of Congress from Indiana, could uh, could possibly want to disrupt their lives for nine months and join a Senate that Evan Bayh says is dysfunctional. How much trouble are they going to have holding on to this seat? Well, certainly a lot more trouble than they would have had um, just last week. He was 20 points ahead, 20 right? 20 points ahead of, of, of Dan Coats, who, a Republican former senator uh, who entered the race in uh, uh, in uh, as bad a way as you could possibly imagine, caught on YouTube saying how much he loved North Carolina. And of course, was glad to leave Indiana did. behind. Glad to leave Indiana. Just right. so much more interesting there. So, <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at the bigger picture yeah. here because Democrats have 16 more seats in the Senate right now than Republicans. 18, if you count the two independents who caucus with them. Right. So it seems pretty amazing that they could actually lose that entire majority in one fell swoop in November, but there is that possibility now. There is that possibility, and, and the possibility is to continue the wave metaphor, which is everything builds to a tidal wave, and so all of these competitive races break in one direction. But I still think it's a, it's a very difficult path, and I think, um, ironically, if anything is going to save Democrats, it's going to be a lot of the uh, competitive frisian within the Republican Party. You look at a state like Kentucky, where uh, the candidate backed by Tea Partiers and conservatives is mounting a pretty aggressive challenge to the establishment Republican candidate. That could be a very messy Republican primary, and there could be a third party challenger, mm -hmm. which would split the Republican vote. You may actually see that in Nevada, too, saving Harry Reid. If there's a Tea Party candidate who runs in Nevada, gets 10 percent of the vote, Harry Reid, who is in as precarious position as any Democrat in the country could be saved. Um, and you look at a state like Ohio, a state like Missouri, where, where Republicans are running very Washington-centric conventional candidates. Democrats with the right combination of luck and good candidates could conceivably, conceivably pick up those seats. Um, there's still, again, I hate to use the cliche, there's a lot of time between now and November, but it's not just that. There are, there are reasons why uh, 2010 is not like 1994, one of them being Republicans are 
as unpopular, if not more unpopular than Democrats. Mm -hmm. So the, the chances of, de of Republicans running the table are pretty slim, but let's look at the math here for a second. Yep. You've got 30 seats that are up for grabs in November. Only about 11 of them are being considered by CBS News right now as very competitive, where the seat could actually change hands. And eight of those seats are held by Democrats. Right. Only three of those seats are held by Republicans. So it looks somewhat inevitable at this point, and of course nine months is a long time, uh, it, it does look inevitable that Republicans will pick up some seats. And a few months ago, we were talking about Democrats picking up a handful of seats. So what happened? Well, look, I think uh, the the economy happened. I think the mismanagement of health care happened, and Democrats are absolutely complicit in that. Um, uh, I think um, the, the deal-making in particular turned off a lot of voters. And I do think that everyone looks at these events through the lens of the last big event, which of course was Scott Brown's victory in Massachusetts. You could make an argument that if Scott Brown hadn't uh, suddenly um, surprised the political world, again, I, I concede, even though it's my job to know politics, I didn't know who the guy was in mid-December. If he hadn't done that, we'd be having a different conversation today. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can't underestimate the fact that we've been living through um, the worst economy in a generation um, with uh, a recovery that's jobless, standards of living which are declining, wage rates which are declining, people feeling incredibly anxious, and a Congress which seems to be able to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, looked, looked through that lens, a lot of this is in some ways overdetermined, it's just a really bad environment. Um, I don't think Democrats, though, anticipated how quickly the energy that they managed to build up over 2008 would dissipate. Um, and that's a bit of a, su of a surprise to them. And who bears the blame for the fact that they didn't anticipate this? I mean, the fact that there's been such gridlock in the Senate, does someone like Leader Harry Reid um, end up being in the crosshairs, especially since yeah. he has such a tough race ahead of him? Could Senate Democrats, for example, say, you know what, actually, we don't think you've, uh, you've been effective as a leader. We haven't been able to pass any of our legislation. You've got a tough race. Maybe you better focus on that, and we'll put someone else in charge. Well, it, Guess who Democrats are going to blame for all, for all this? George Bush. They sure. blame George Bush for leaving such a mess that Democrats just couldn't couldn't weigh their way out of it. And there's some there's some truth to that. Um, but even in this state of hyper polarization, mm -hmm. um, we've never really experienced a time when it seemed as if uh, a party with so much power, so much concentrated power, and such a popular president. Obama still remains the most popular political figure in the country couldn't get anything done, and even the stuff they could get done, they couldn't communicate to people that they got it done. Um, whose fault is that? It's not my fault. It's not the Republicans' fault. It's the Democrats' fault. And they got to figure out, as I think they've been doing over the past couple of weeks, mm -hmm. how to change the cost-benefit incentive structure in Congress, how to make it more difficult for Republicans to obstruct the Democratic agenda, how to make it more difficult for Democrats not to go along with the president. I think mm -hmm. in the past couple of weeks with some of the presidential co news conferences we've been seeing, some of the rhetoric from the White House, you're seeing an attempt to shift those cost-benefit incentives, and we'll have to see whether it works. With things like this meeting that he's scheduling, this televised right. meeting with the Republicans. And very briefly, it's putting the Republicans on the defensive because they have no idea how to respond, and they're, John Boehner's, I don't know, well, where it's a, it's a <laughs> set up and all that. Yeah. That means Republicans are, for the first time in a long time, on the defensive, Democrats mm -hmm. are on the offensive, Maybe we're seeing a little bit of dynamic shifting. Maybe. Well, it's a new one, and it will make for fantastic television. It so uh, we'll I'm excited cover. about that. Mark Amender, thank you so much for coming in sure. to talk about this with us today. Moving on to the war on terror now. Several days ago, a top military advisor for the Taliban in Afghanistan was captured in a joint Pakistani-U.S. intelligence mission. Experts are calling the capture a significant blow to the Taliban. They say he's a high-value target. CBS News' national security correspondent David Martin joins me now from the Pentagon. And David, what can you tell us about uh, how he was captured and whether he's talking? Well, uh, Mullah Berater uh, is talking, but it is not clear that he is uh, giving up information of value. He is in Pakistani custody, and the U.S. is only being given limited access to him. And uh, most people do not expect him to uh, spill the beans very quickly. But even uh, with that in mind, just getting him off uh, the battlefield and into a prison is is a major uh, development in the war in Afghanistan because uh, this mullah was the top 
commander of the Taliban fighters who were killing American soldiers in Afghanistan. He was the person who devised and executed the overall strategy for how the Taliban are going to deal with this big troop uh, buildup that President Obama has ordered. So he is a big catch. And uh, what makes it uh, doubly big is the fact that uh, it happened in Pakistan after years of the Pakistanis saying there are no Taliban leaders here. So now they have gone and uh, suddenly found the number two Taliban leader in one of their largest cities, Karachi. I heard Senator Kerry saying this morning that this is a sign that the Americans and the Pakistanis are cooperating to a greater degree than they have in the past. Is that mm -hmm. what the military is saying as well, or do they think that they could have <clears throat> achieved this a year ago, a couple of years ago? It's a sign, but it's not proof. It is not at all clear to me that uh, the, the Pakistanis really want to have such a high-ranking uh, Taliban official in their custody. Uh, because any high-ranking Taliban official also knows about the complicity of the Pakistani government in supporting the Afghan Taliban, and he could end up telling uh, the Americans more than the Pakistanis want the Americans to know. But you shouldn't take, it, take away the fact that the number two guy has been taken off the table, at least for now. Now, I know that this was uh, a, an operation that was uh, in part driven by the CIA, so it's pretty difficult to get details about exactly how this all went down. But what have you been able to glean about how they were able to infiltrate these inner circles of the Taliban and get him? Well, the intelligence on uh, the Taliban in, in Pakistan has been getting better and better. And how they do that, obviously, is a pretty closely guarded secret. But they, they, the CIA, has somehow managed to infiltrate spies or put in technical devices that allow them to track uh, scores of senior leaders and fighters uh, for both the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistan Taliban and al-Qaeda, all the, the witch's brew that is, is uh, uh, using Pakistan as a sanctuary. And that's why we have all these uh, CIA drone strikes, is because the intelligence on the location of uh, these, uh, these insurgents is getting better and better. And I expect that uh, finding uh, this mullah in, in the middle of uh, what is really a, a chaotic and teeming city was also a product of this improved intelligence. Does this mean that they could be closer to tracking down someone like Osama bin Laden? Well, there's a big difference uh, because this mullah was operational. He was running the war on a day-to-day -day basis in Afghanistan. And when you do that, you have to travel around, you have to meet with uh, your commanders, you probably have to uh, uh, use uh, cell phones or other means of communication. And that is very different from uh, just hiding out, which is what Osama bin Laden seems to be doing. When you go operational, you always risk exposing yourself. Bin Laden has remained out of the operational uh, orbit for some time now. One last question. What does this mean in practical terms for the U.S. fight against the Taliban, and what is going to happen to this mullah now? Well, in the short term, it's probably not going to have much impact. There's, there's an offensive going on now in in Helmand province, uh, but that is a village-by-village uh, village fight of small unit tactics and uh, sort of way below uh, the strategic level which this mullah operated on. But in the long run, this is the guy who was responsible for the strategy of how to combat the big American troop buildup that the president has ordered. And without him, they can probably find another person to take over the responsibilities, but will they find somebody as good and someone who is as trusted as uh, Mullah Berater was by the leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar? That's a great question. Well, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating story and a, a bright spot for the uh, military in Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. military there. So uh, David Martin at the Pentagon, thank you so much for joining us today to sure tell thing. us about it.
And thank you for watching Washington Unplugged. You can join us here every weekday at 12.30 p.m. And make sure you watch the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric tonight for the latest in the Senate breakdown and on the capture in Afghanistan. I'm Nancy Cordes. Thanks for watching and have a great day. If we don't expand our imagination, justification for being what you